I'm just going to introduce Imran uh, just before we uh, turn the, the presentation over to him. So Imran is a UX manager. He's currently working at Otto um, in Yorkshire. Is that in Huddersfield, Imran? That's in Bradford. Bradford. Yeah. Um, Imran's got a background in research, design and development. And for the past 13 years, he's been working with a wide range of teams uh, on different digital projects. Um, he's developed several research and design teams from the ground up and mentor designers, researchers from junior to senior levels. Um, after establish, establishing the UX team at Otto, where he currently works, he's been working hard to develop a user-centered design culture at the organization. I think that's a lot, a lot of us here who probably want to do the same. Uh, like most of us, Imran believes that working in UX provides the opportunity to have a positive impact on the world. And I for one agree with that. And he feels that if he is motivated to create inclusive products that harness the best of humanity and technology. Um, thank you very much for joining us, everybody. And uh, I'll now hand over to Imran, if you're ready. Thank you very much. So thank you, Laura, for the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Imran, as Laura said. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I've been to many events um, at NUX, both in person and um, virtually, and I've always come away from those events um, feeling inspired by the speakers um, and also by the content and the insights that have been shared. Um, I really hope I can do the same for everyone in this session today. I really hope I can leave people feeling like they've learned something new, perhaps something to make them feel inspired about um, in the future. Um, as Laura said, my background is in UX. I'm a UX manager at the moment. Um, I manage a team of product designers, UX designers um, and researchers. Um, and this, this topic that I want to talk about today, reflective practice, is a topic that's really, really dear to my heart. Um, it's a topic that I feel is really important to UX um, and I feel really strongly about sharing it. It's why I chose this topic um, um, for this talk. So to start with, um, what I'd like to do is just talk about my son, Ayan. He's, he's four years old. Um, like every child, he's is really, really curious about the world. Um, and to me, as his father, it's really fascinating to see him grow. He's constantly learning new things. He's constantly doing different things, sometimes things that he shouldn't be doing. But regardless, he's constantly trying and learning through experience and getting things wrong. Um, and he really brings a beginner's mind to everything. Um, you know, all children do. They, they bring a bring a, bring a beginner's mind to every experience, every situation. Um, and I remember sort of being interested in psychology. I remember reading about, um, you know, how, how the child's mind develops at a young age. And I remember reading that age two to three, children start to develop a sense of independence. They start to understand that being independent is a real thing. It's okay for them to be away from their parents and their guardians. Um, and it was really interesting because I connected back to what I was going through with Ayan at the time. He was, he was fairly clingy as a child quite um, in his early years. Um, and it was around about age three, which is when this picture that you can see on screen was taken. Um, he started to develop a sense of independence. Um, and for him, it was about being brave. It was about trusting me and my partner when we were allowing him to go to the park, as you can see in this picture to sort of you know, run off with the ball on his own and so on. Um, and this picture was probably taken, I would say, kind of halfway through that process, if you could somehow quantify it. And um, as you can see in the picture, it's an ordinary picture, but to me, it carries so much meaning because he's having that glance back to look at me, um, just doing that check that is dad there, you know, does dad call out to me? Um, you know, um, how far can I go before I don't see dad, you know, because everything's new to him. He doesn't know what's possible or what is impossible. Um, and seeing him push these boundaries 
and then constantly learning and applying what he's learning into the next iteration of the experience in his life is something that really, really fascinates me. And it kind of forms the basis of what I want to really talk about today. If we try and get to the science of this a little bit, um, it's a known fact that children are fast learners. You know, they, they quickly grasp concepts, they quickly, um, you know, try things and learn from trying and failing and so on. And all children are like that, the hands are no different. Um, and when we look at the science of it, this is some research that was done by um, Harvard, Harvard University, um, looking at how the child's mind develops. Um, and on this graph, what you can see really ultimately um, is a summary of um, how the brain's ability kind of changes as we get older. So if we look on the left-hand side of the graph, um, essentially what it's saying is that um, the brain's ability in a child um, you know, is, is quite strong um, in bringing about change based on, on experience. So in other words, having an experience, learning from that, and then applying it into that experience when it happens again. Um, and the amount of effort it takes for a child is, is quite low. You know, it, it just happens almost naturally. They do it subconsciously. You know, children don't go and sit down and think about an experience they've had. They just have an experience and then they just build on whatever they learn. They just soak up so much information. And obviously, if you look on the right hand side of the graph, um, for adults, um, you can see a decline in so many respects because the ability to change your response to experiences is actually in decline as we get older. And, you know, kind of linked to that is the amount of effort it takes to make a change based on experience. So it's interesting to think about this and really ask, well, what, what causes this? You know, there isn't a single cause. There's, there's multiple causes for this. Um, if we go a little deeper into the science of it, one of the reasons, one of the causes is actually the fact that adults have built up really, really strong habits of, around how they um, experience things, how they behave, how they think, how they approach everyday life, be it work or personal life. Um, and for children, as I said earlier, like a yarn, they bring a beginner's mind to everything. So naturally what they do is they experience something new and they start to use that new experience to learn and develop, whereas adults are almost on the opposite end of the spectrum because we've spent years and decades building up, you know, experience and habits and things that we've always done a certain way. Um, and again, it's a known fact, you know, the way the brain works is um, it, it wants to do the easiest thing. You know, if there's, there's an action that you need to take or think about or approach in a certain way, the brain will want you to take the easiest route. And this graph just highlights how, um, how the brain develops connections um, as we go through different stages of life. And those connections exist between brain cells or, or neurons, if you wanna use a scientific word. Um, and for children, you know, they don't have many connections um, um, between those brain cells, so they quickly develop a lot of them. For adults, you can see on this graph, there's a clear decline. And that's because actually you've made all your connections throughout your life over decades, and you start to rely more on those, therefore developing a new connection and learning from that and developing new experiences um, and learning through those is actually taking a lot more effort. There's another reason as well. I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, will be familiar with this site, seeing your phone screen or seeing something that gives you notifications and seeing so many things demanding your attention. You know, we live in a world which is constantly changing and is constantly demanding our attention, um, be it through the watch that we wear, the phone, everything we do at work. You know, we're constantly living in this society and this culture that demands attention from us. And it actually makes it really, really hard for us to stop and really think about, you know, how we approach things, how we can possibly evolve because for children that happens naturally, for adults, it doesn't happen naturally because we've seen in the science, it's quite hard for it to happen. It takes a lot of effort. So it really needs effort from us. Even in work terms, you know, this, this is what a calendar can look like. You know, the amount of meetings and the calls, I mean, so many of us are working from home now and that's really transformed how we, 
how we approach our work. You know, we have far more calls now than we probably did meetings when we were in the office. I know I certainly do. Um, and you know, where where do we get that time to stop and really think? You know, where do we get that time to really allow ourselves to process our thoughts and everything like that? Um, and it can be really hard because in the UX space, we're jumping from one product release to another one piece of design research, written work, content managed, whatever it is, you know, complete one day and then starting on the next piece. And it's just, it's very constant. You know, the life around us, the work and everything that we're involved in is very, very constant. Now for the record, that isn't my calendar. Um, it can get like that sometimes, but that isn't my calendar. So for anybody from HR is watching, then please don't worry, you don't need to, um, call me tomorrow morning to ask me what's happening on my calendar. Um, so obviously when, when we're really busy, um, you know, often we, we kind of lose our sense of awareness. Um, you know, we're not as aware of what's going on around us. We're not as aware of how we behave and how we go about doing things um, because we're just so busy and we're so sort of, you know, kind of like, going from one thing to the other and there's never that moment to stop and think and obviously as the science says it's hard enough to do anyway but with a society and a culture that doesn't promote it doesn't allow time for thinking it becomes even even harder um, to be self-aware so self-awareness is is really a key thing um, self-awareness is critical to all forms of learning um, and at this stage, I just want to introduce this, um, this particular learning model, which was developed by Martin Broadwell in the 1960s. Um, and he was a learning theorist, uh, a tutor, you know, he was working with psychologists at the time, and he was really trying to understand, you know, how, how do people learn, you know, where do they start their learning from, you know, how do people grow, how do they become kind of really, really exceptional in, in their field. And he built this model, and, and this model, if we start from from the bottom of it at stage one, it, his kind of summary was that it starts, learning starts in a place where, um, you know, a given person isn't aware of the things that they don't know. You know, if I'm not aware of something that I could do differently for a yarn as a father or as a parent, I can't possibly act on it. You know, if I'm not aware of it, I can't learn from it. Um, it's actually stage two of this model where you become aware of the things that you don't know that you can start to act upon them. However, it's that jump from one to two, that's the critical piece, because if you never become aware, you can't act upon it. Um, and this model, the four stages of competence, um, obviously it goes up, so you know, stage three is where you know about it, but you have to think about it um, before you do it. And stage four is that, you know, that high point where essentially to connect all of this back together, we're talking about a habit really. You've become so good at it that you don't have to think about it. Your brain sees it as an easy to do and repeat action. Um, and it can just it can just do it without thinking about it. Um, so awareness is is you know the key thing that really I'm I'm trying to get into here. Um, you know, if if awareness isn't there, then it can it can obviously lead to a lot of problems because you can't possibly um, you know, understand what you need to learn and what you need to change. So how do you, how do you become more self-aware? You know, we've kind of looked at a lot of different things and graphs and research, and we're kind of saying actually self-awareness for adults is, is critical because for children, it, it's something they do naturally. So how, how do adults, you know, get to this place where they can become more, more self-aware? Well, this is where reflective practice um, comes in. Um, and reflective practice is really the ability for us to uh, kind of reflect on our thoughts, our actions, our behaviors, um, anything that we've experienced in order to engage in this process of continuous learning. Um, you know, it, reflection allows us to kind of process information. Reflection allows us to press pause on our lives and say, you know what, I'm actually going to just stop and think about what I'm doing, how I'm doing my work and how I'm going about, um, you know, interacting with different people and different situations and things like that. Um, and, and reflective practice ultimately makes you more self-aware, which is why um, it's, it's critical to this, this theme that we're sort of exploring at the moment. 
So self-awareness in itself is, is fascinating. Um, uh, you know, back in the 1970s, a couple of social psychologists started exploring the concept of self-awareness. Um, and generally in societies accepted that if I have some thoughts, um, actually my thoughts and, you know, me as a person, that's a single entity. Um, these social, social psychologists started exploring the concept of actually them being two different entities. So actually me and my thoughts are two separate entities and actually I can stand back and carefully analyze my thoughts and actually change them in the future. Um, and that in itself is a, a really, really interesting sort of jumping point as we head into the detail around reflective practice and so on, because actually it's all underpinned by self-awareness. It's underpinned by this concept of actually, we can change our thoughts, we can change how we do things, we can evolve as long as we understand that we're not judging ourselves, we're actually looking at our thoughts through the lens of a separate entity. So back in, um, back in 2014, Harvard did some, some research on, on this topic. You've probably gathered by now, I'm a big fan of research done by Harvard. A lot of it's quite fascinating. So I've already got two pieces in this so far. Um, so Harvard, Harvard University did some research on um, what reflection means. And they basically um, did a social experiment. They got two groups of people together, asked both groups to complete given tasks over a day. So it's effectively like they were working. Um, and one group, not both, one group was asked to um, take 15 minutes to, to kind of reflect at the end of the day to say, well, actually, what, what lessons did I learn? You know, how did it go for me today? What was good? Did I get bored? Did I find it interesting? What would make it better? Um, and gradually, they started to see that the second group in this experiment started to perform better um, almost by 23% versus the first group. Um, and it, it was quite telling because actually that second group started to feel happier. Um, they felt more productive. They felt less burnt out. Um, and it kind of goes back to this whole idea. You know, if you're allowing yourself 15 minutes just to process your thoughts, it can have a real nice knock-on effect to how you understand what you've done and how you're going to do it in the future. And if we just if we just stop for a moment and think about that, that's 15 minutes. You know, it's not it's not a really, really lengthy amount of time spent doing this reflection um, in this group. It was just 15 minutes at the end of the day. And even with that short amount of time, you know, people were able to kind of get benefit out of it. What I'd like to do is just briefly talk about people that have found success through um, um, kind of self-awareness, reflective practice. I start with Ryan Holmes. Um, you may have heard of him. Um, he kind of um, developed and was the founding member of um, Hootsuite, which is the social media management platform. And he openly talks about the fact that he does a lot of yoga. Um, he spends a lot of time um, thinking about how he's, um, you know, kind of working with his colleagues and teams and where he's going with his business and his career and, you know, what aspirations he has. And he really credits a lot of his success you know, having gone from this small company to this global company, um, down to the fact that he always made time um, to self-reflect, always made time to kind of process his experiences and, and everything that he was going through. If we step outside of the tech sphere, um, you know, we've, we've got so many people from different fields. Um, I've only Put three people on this but you could have so many more people to talk about at this stage and they've all found success in their lives they're at the top of their game in their respective fields you've got Brene Brown I'm sure many of you will have heard of um, she's so inspiring in the books and everything that she's written and done um, and yet she openly talks about the fact that um, you know she's a really really strong introvert who found it really scary going on stage um, and she really panicked and, you know, suffered from anxiety and things like that. Um, and actually taking time to think about how she was approaching those situations helped her to have the courage to say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to push myself through this. I'm going to be brave and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to kind of do what I need to in order to kind of build up my confidence and evolve myself. Serena Williams, you know, at the top of her game in, in tennis, 
And again, someone who said, you know, she's not lost many finals or games in her career. She's just been unbelievable um, as a person, as, as an athlete as well. But when she has lost, what's helped her is pausing and self-reflecting and actually thinking about the things that she needs to do different, however small, um, to actually think about what she needs to change. Um, and Lionel Messi, again, I'm sure many will have heard of him. He's arguably the best footballer in the world, um, possibly the best footballer that's ever been. Um, and again, if you look at his history as he was growing up, you know, he was obsessed with football and things like that. But he always, always had this practice in place where he would take time away from his, his craft, from his sport and from his passion to really think about what small things he could change um, in order to be more successful. Um, and for those that watch him play, you'll know that he barely, you know, he barely runs around a great deal when he's, when he's on the pitch and yet he orchestrates everything. And that's, that's through him reflecting and understanding his place on, um, you know, on the pitch alongside all of his teammates. So we've talked a lot about people that have found success. You know, there's a, there's a number of benefits that you can get out of um, um, kind of taking up reflective practice and self-awareness and things like that. Um, many of the benefits that I've found by introducing this into my life, and I've done it for, for years and years now, um, the first is you get a lot of perspective. You know, we in, in the UX space, we often talk about empathy and, you know, empathetic design and things like that. But really what we need is perspective. You know, different perspective helps us understand how we can evolve our work and how our perspective isn't the only one that actually matters. Um, and that really comes from, you know, stopping and really thinking about things really, really carefully um, in regards to past experience. You know, clarity of thought is an obvious one. If you stop and really carefully let your so thoughts kind of like come together, you will, you will find that there's some clarity that comes about and it help you make decisions and things like that. Appreciation, you know, sometimes we don't realize how fortunate and lucky we are and through reflection, we can really start to come to terms with that and we can be more thankful for the things that we have and it and it can it can lead to confidence because the more we learn, the more we um, evolve, the more we change and feel like we're taking positive steps in our work or life, it breeds confidence, you know, everybody likes to learn. Um, you know, it gets back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, when you learn, you you feel kind of positive and, and really good about it. And you know, you know, reflective practice, um, you know, definitely kind of helps helps with that. And obviously, you know, everything we've spoken about so far, self awareness is a critical thing that um, reflective practice helps with. When you become self aware, you have the ability to act. That is that is the critical thing. Now, I just want to pause on this point for a moment because so far I've kind of gone into the science and I've explained, you know, it sounds like reflective practices, you know, it's it's straightforward and we can start doing it and it's, um, you know, something that we can just learn to do. The reality is that it's actually really, really hard. Um, you know, reflection is really hard and the key thing with it is it can be painful, painful work. And I think it's, it's important to just kind of digest that for a moment um, because when you look at yourself and when you look at, you know, what you're doing and what you need to change, it can be quite painful to kind of look back on that and think, well, you know, how do I change this? And, you know, kind of recognizing things that you could do differently can be quite hard. It can be quite difficult for people to accept that, um, which is why that detachment is, is so important. But even more important than that, you've got to kind of come out of your comfort zone and you've got to have that courage to sort of try and explore your inner thoughts, your behaviors, your attitudes, everything, and really ask yourself, you know, well, what can I do more of, less of? What can I learn from what I've done so far? Um, and this this quote from, from Brene, Brene Brown is one that kind of, I think it says everything I want to say, you know, you can choose courage or you can choose comfort. You cannot have both. Um, I think... I think in our life as adults, you know, comfort is what we live through. We've seen the science in it, you know, earlier, you know, we, we kind of rely on habits. We don't make as many different new connections in our brain, you know, change requires effort. So comfort is what we naturally fall into. It's comfort is what I fall into. Comfort is what most people fall into. 
but um, you've got you've got to find the courage. You've got to find that courage to overcome that, um, and you've got to go forward. You know, quite boldly in that sense. And there's nobody more inspiring than Brene Brown with that. As I said earlier, for her to kind of go up, you know, early on she was going to these big IT companies and talking to a bunch of men and trying to tell them how to kind of run their systems and what they needed to do with their teams. And it was really daunting for her, but she did so amazingly well. She was brave and she had the courage to carry on. And it just shows, you know, um, you know, from how well she's done in, in her career. So where do you start? You know, it's all good and well saying, you know, you're going to find this courage and yeah, you're ready to kind of explore your inner thinking, your attitudes, your behavior and so on. But where do you actually start with reflective practice? Um, so reflective practice is, is there's kind of like two critical parts to it, which I've found in my experience. Um, and the first one is really about kind of, you know, allowing yourself to have this environment where you foster reflection. You know, it's not just about diving in and saying, right, I'm going to go and sit on the chair and I'm, I'm going to start reflecting or thinking about things. You've got to create a, a good environment that allows you to reflect. Um, an environment that allows you to breed kind of positive thoughts around yourself and allows you to detach from, from everything that you're, you're doing and everything that you're thinking. And then the second part is actually to reflect and act upon it. So what I'd like to do is we'll dive into the first part um, and just try and explore that a little bit in more detail. Um, and from my experience, I'll share with you the key activities, behaviors that are needed in order to kind of get through this first stage so you can get into the second stage. Um, and obviously that will result in, you know, reflective practice, you know, being something that you can introduce into your life and work. So I've spoken about this earlier, but that first stage of creating that good environment for yourself, it absolutely starts with seeking perspective. Um, I would say that perspective is really the fuel for reflection. Um, without perspective, you haven't got um, enough ammo, enough fuel, whatever you wanna call it, whatever commodity it is, in order to properly reflect. And remember perspective equals empathy. So when we look for perspective, we're trying to empathize with other people. We're trying to better appreciate different perspectives and saying, you know what, I'm not always right. And my perspective might not always represent what everyone else thinks and, you know, trying to overcome our bias. So what you have to do is you have to seek out perspective. So whether you're a, a writer, designer, developer, manager, whatever role you do, researcher, you know, seek out perspective, you know, be brave, have that courage to ask for feedback, to share ideas, ask your peers, ask your colleagues, ask your friends and family for things um, to help you get more perspective on, on your craft, on yourself as a person and so on. And it's so critical, like I said, to this whole, this whole process of um, reflective practice. The second critical part in order to kind of foster that reflection is downtime. Everybody needs downtime. You know, our life, as I've said, is unbelievably busy. We're always on the go. We never stop. There's always one thing after another, whether it's work, whether it's home life. Um, and it can be really hard finding that time to say, you know what, I'm going to just step back from everything and I'm going to do that thing that disconnects me from, from my craft, from my work, from, you know, all those thoughts from a day of meetings and all those calls and those problems I need to solve and, you know, trying to help my team and trying to help my other colleagues. It can just be really overwhelming. So, one of the things you have to do is have downtime and downtime is time away from everything you know whether it's cycling jogging whether it's reading a book playing a game watching something it's just getting away from what you normally do and it allows you to just almost clear your head a little bit and detach from the things that you're probably going to go and reflect on you know you're unlikely to go and reflect on some of the things that you're doing as a part of downtime so it kind of helps you create that um, that separation and gets you away from your work. For example, for, for me, I don't think I could function without, without downtime. I have to have at least 30 to 45 minutes every day. At, at the end of the day, in the evening, when I feel like I've fulfilled everything I need to do as a, um, you know, as a, as a person that works, as a, um, you know, as a husband, as a father, as a family member, when I fulfilled everything, I need that downtime that is my motivation for getting through the day and then being able to say, right, I'm ready for whatever tomorrow is going to, is going to bring for me. 
The third and last part, which is really, really critical to um, kind of fostering this reflection is, is actually getting some alone time. Um, and alone time can seem like a daunting thing, a difficult thing. And perhaps it isn't because we're now, we're now sat at home working on our own in, in these rooms by ourselves most of the time. So maybe it's different, but you know, alone time, think of your thoughts um, as if they're leaves falling from a tree and just think about the idea of letting them settle. Um, you know, we never let our thoughts settle. We're just constantly doing, doing, doing more than we need to. And just to have that moment where we allow our thoughts to sort of settle into place and we can just get some perspective. It's similar to that feeling of, um, you know, hindsight, you know, when you have an experience and in that experience, you feel one way. And then a few weeks later, you look back and go, well, actually now I've kind of got a different perspective on it now. You know, I wish I hadn't done, said that, whatever. Um, that's what alone time can do as well. It just allows you to process your day. Um, if you've had a lot of beatings, whatever it is you've done, it just allows you to process things a little bit, let them settle into place, help you understand what they mean and, and what it means for, for the future. And hopefully with those, with those uh, kind of behaviours, those sort of activities, you've created an environment for your, for your mind, for yourself, for your body, for everything um, to start reflecting, um, to start reflecting and to actually start acting upon it. So when you get to this second stage, um, one thing that can help is, you know, it's not just about sitting down and saying, right, I'm going to reflect. It doesn't come naturally. Remember, science says it takes effort to question where we need to bring about change. So before you make a habit of reflection, you need to start somewhere to build towards that habit. Um, and often what you should do and what I found in the past has worked well for me is to actually prompt reflective thought. Um, to ask yourself questions, um, you know, that you can try and just think about. It's not about formally writing them down or responding to them, but it's actually thinking about them um, and thinking about what, what thoughts sort of come to mind when you think of these questions. So in a given situation, you might say, you know, what happened? What feelings do I have about the situation? You know, were there any perspectives I didn't consider? Um, you know, was there anything anything good or bad about the experience that, you know, I, I'm kind of like thinking about now and I need to think about more carefully. Um, and, you know, sometimes it can be about, you know, what was done well um, that should be done again. And that, that to me is quite important. Your reflection isn't a negative thing. You know, it's not designed to make you feel, it's not designed to make you feel bad about yourself. It's, you know, it's it, by design, it's about you understanding more about yourself in a good way so you can grow, evolve and be the best of who you are. Um, and everybody deserves that chance. So it's not designed to say, well, you know, let's just look for all the negative stuff. Um, you know, there might be an abundance of things that you're doing um, that are really, really good. And you want to keep those going because you don't want to lose those while you try and focus on on the things that do need to change in your in your work, in your craft or whatever you're doing. And obviously that links in nicely to, you know, changes in the future when when you kind of prompt this reflective thought ask yourself, you know, in that particular scenario, when I designed, when I researched a certain way, what could have I done different? What can I change in the future? You know, did I, um, did I start preparing too late, too early? Would that have helped? So really ask yourself about the changes that you can potentially make um, in the future. Another, another thing that can help with um, reflective practice when it comes to actually doing the reflection and trying to act upon it is to make an artifact, um, you know, something that you can look back on. Like any artifact, you know, it's something that you can, you can revisit at a later date. You know, sometimes we have thoughts that, you know, are quite new to us and we can look back months later, years later, and we, we won't be able to recall everything. So it's good to create something. You know, this is something that I did quite a while back um, um, for something with a yarn when he had an appointment. And I remember almost a year later when we took him again for uh, an, an appointment for immunization at the GP, kind of looking at this again and sort of saying, well, hold on, what happened last time? You know, what, what was it that I did and what could I do different and things? And it doesn't have to be anything fancy. You know, this is not about, you know, some sort of retrospective kind of document you've got to fill in or something like that. This is about just doing something having some sort of platform canvas that you can use to kind of capture your thoughts. And, you know, what I would say from experience is that there's definitely something to be said for 
um, creating something tangible, creating something real, and actually the act of creating it um, kind of connects you to those thoughts more than it just being something in your head. Um, it, it kind of like somehow helps them manifest themselves, you know, physically as a, as a, as a piece of paper or whatever it might be. And it does actually help um, in my experience, especially in those earlier days when you're quite new to reflective practice and you're trying to introduce it into your work, into your career. The final part of um, reflect and act, the second part of this whole reflective practice process is to be brave and experiment. Um, and this brings us back to that first slide, you know, that I was talking through about a yarn. Um, you know, for us as adults to bring about change, positive change, and to learn about ourselves and to act upon it, we need to be brave. Um, we need to experiment. We need to have that courage to do the things that may not seem like they're easy or normal, um, but to do them because we believe that they might actually be the right thing for us as individuals, for our careers, for our lives as well. Um, and it, it's so important to all of this, you know, to tie it all together. You know, this is why I wanted to speak about Ayan at the start. You know, it's all about kind of thinking in those terms, you know, about being brave and trial and error and things like that. There is no harm in getting things wrong. You know, um, nobody is perfect. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes all the time. But I think what I what I do well is I keep trying and I keep changing things. Um, even when I look back on talks that I've done in the past, um, every talk is slightly different because I feel like I've learned something and I've tried to evolve it and change it. And it doesn't, the changes don't always work, but um, I feel like I'm trying and I feel like I'm trying to evolve my, my approach. Um, and now thinking back to when I used to drive into the office, I remember um, it was quite funny because I was just, uh, yeah, Jan was quite young and I, I, you know, I had a really, really busy schedule and I was like, I never get time to stop now. I'm just literally on the go. Even that half an hour I wanted in the evening wasn't possible because it was like, Jan wouldn't sleep during the night and I'd be up and down and stuff like that trying to help my partner. And what I used to do was um, I'd be driving home from work and I'd switch off the radio. <laughs> I wouldn't listen to any radio at all or any music or anything. And I love listening to music, but I just switch it off for the 45 minute hour long journey. And, you know, driving is something we do through habit, isn't it? So it would just be perfect to allow my thoughts to settle in it. And it, it worked. It was an experiment. I didn't read about it anywhere. I just tried it and it, and it worked well. Um, so you've got to do that. And, you know, I've included a picture of um, the prime minister of New Zealand, you know, she's, um, She's an unbelievable person, leader, and she's changing everything that people know or believe about politicians, the way she connects with people, the way she connects with her communities, and the, and the risks that she takes in order to be this compassionate leader, you know, is, is really setting her apart from different people and other people that are, you know, leaders around the world. Um, and she's, she's openly a person that talks about, you know, taking time to reflect, taking time to consider things. And, you know, when she was quite early in her career, she was heavily challenged by people saying, you know, almost laughing at her saying, well, you know, you're, you're too compassionate. You'll, you'll never make it as a politician. And she's proved so many people wrong. Um, and she is such a strong, inspirational leader. Um, and I couldn't think of a better, you know, better photo to include on, on this slide to kind of try and put this powerful image um, image on here, which, you know, kind of evoked so many different emotions across the world when this image was presented, you know, when a tragedy happened in, in New Zealand. And I think it's so powerful to see people, you know, um, really, really high up in the world and whatever they're doing to be able to try these things and to experiment and try and push the boundaries of what's possible in the same way that children do. So I feel like we've we've kind of gone through a lot of different concepts, a lot of examples, lots of different things that you can try. Um, but it kind of, you know, we've kind of tied everything together, hopefully quite nicely, but we come back to this, this critical question, you know, perhaps some of it's already answered, but why is reflective practice important to, to UX? You know, why is it important, um, you know, to the UX community? 
Um, you know, if you're a researcher or a designer or a developer or a writer or a manager or a product owner, why, why is this important? Um, you know, what does this give you that, you know, um, you know, should be motivating you to kind of take this up? Well, let's just start by briefly having a look at this slide. This is taken from Nielsen Norman Group's uh, research around UX careers. They did it earlier in this year. It's a great report. The link is on the slide for those that are interested in having a look at it. I would strongly urge you to do that. Um, and it was really kind of looking at, you know, where is UX? What place does it have in the world? And this, this table um, essentially shows that UX is everywhere. Um, UX is in every, um, every profession, whether it's to do with cars, finance, advertising, retail, healthcare, UX is playing a part in everything. And that means it's playing a big part in our society. Um, and you know, as a UX community, we're at the forefront of change in these, in these sectors, within these areas. Um, and this whole effect, you know, has, has grown, you know, at an unbelievable rate over the past six to seven months. You know, as, as the pandemic's kicked in, there's a bigger focus online there's a bigger focus on people using technology to do things. You know, people are having these stressful, difficult lives. People are suffering from mental health issues from, you know, working from home and, you know, being furloughed or losing their jobs or worse, you know, having loved ones, you know, um, you know, passing away due to the pandemic and things like that. And they're using technology, you know, to do the things that they have to do, whether it's shopping or talking to a friend and getting support from someone. And the work we do touches everything you know it touches you can see from this chart so many so many parts of society um and that is that is really my closing message you know this is why reflective practice is so important because um the work we create in our community um regardless of what role we do um it has far-reaching consequences you know we you know, we can really impact our society in a positive way. That might not seem like it's possible, um, but I assure you it is possible through the work that we do. You know, we're on the front line helping our organizations decide what is the best way to deliver this service or this experience. Um, you, know, you know, to be in that position is something that, you know, we can be proud of, but something that we can be motivated about as well, because actually, our continuous learning is critical. You know, if, if we're at this forefront uh, of you know, society trying to make sure that what goes out into this digital UX um, you know, kind of space, then surely our continuous learning is important because we want to create the best services, the best experience um, that we can give back to our society in a time when, you know, we need to help people as much as we can. You know, we don't want to create experiences that create problems for people. We want to help society, we want to have that positive impact. Um, and, and continuous learning and reflective practice is critical to that on two fronts, because if you think of it from a macro perspective, it's our community. We want to grow as a community. We want to evolve. We want our organizations, um, the world to realize and see how important UX is to everything that we do. Um, even in those orgs and teams and products and services where there isn't a UX team or person looking after that area. Um, and if we look at it from a micro perspective, we move away from macro, which is a community to micro, I would say it's about our careers. You know, we've seen people find success through continuous learning. You know, Brene Brown being a person, um, you know, someone who was very um, afraid to go on the stage and she went on stage for the first time and she was nervous and she was shaking and things but she did it you know um, it's important for our careers to continually learn about ourselves our surroundings how we approach things because when we do that for our careers um, we can definitely achieve you know um, massive amounts of success and we can be the best of who we are in this UX space um, and that really is is my my closing message you know we we have so much we can influence and through reflective practice we can make sure what we influence evolves alongside how we evolve our learning and how we evolve by understanding ourselves and our place in this world um, in a better way 
Thank you very much. That's the end of my talk. Thank you, Ma'am. That was fantastic. There's um, there's definitely been love on Twitter, and we've got a couple of questions for you. If you're okay. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Um, and if you know, I often find that when um, we've got these sessions, might start to come in thick and fast as as we start into this conversation. So the Q and A is still open. Feel free to add mm. questions to that. Um, but the first question that we've got. What do you see as the difference between reflective practice and being self-critical that could have connotations with negativity? So the biggest difference, and it is, there's a fine line there, and I, I believe I touched on it as well, that it's easy to almost assume that self-reflection and reflective practice is a negative thing. It's not. Self-reflection and reflective practice is actually a positive thing. It's not about being critical of yourself. It's actually looking at yourself and saying, um, you know, what's my place in this world and what's my place in this team and the environment that I work in? You know, what am I, what am I doing? It's not about good and bad. It's actually just saying, well, you know, what have I learned from that? Have I learned anything? Is there anything that I can change? Um, and it's important to focus on the positive side of it, um, not to see it as a way to kind of criticize yourself and, you know, kind of beat yourself up about it. It's about evolution in the same way that it is you know, for children. Um, so I would, I would say, yeah, there's a fine line there, but it's important that you look at it from that positive perspective, that through trial and error, um, you're trying to evolve yourself as a person in a positive way, not focusing on kind of like, you know, criticizing yourself or anything like that. Great, thank you. Next question. Um, really excellent talk. Thank you. Feedback. Um, how do you find it best to convince product managers that this reflection is essential? I find that designers are on board, but the product managers can be a bit too backlog or process driven. and Don't appreciate the thought that is required to do our best work. I think in my experience, one of the things uh, that can help is when you're presenting any ideas or anything of what you're hoping to deliver, if it's a change on a product or a service, is try and show some of uh, the background work that you've done, some of the rationalization that you've done. Try and get your thoughts out onto paper. I encourage my team to do that all the time. And I think it's a cultural shift. So it's not something you can do um, where you just show someone something and they'll suddenly start to believe you that's, you know, reflective practice is important. It's like a cultural shift. The more you show people that, you know, UX design is not just sitting in Photoshop or Figma and making something nice. It's actually you getting away, like I encourage my team to get away from the desk and think through the problem that you're trying to solve and try and you know, document all your thinking, your thoughts, the research and things like that. Um, and the more you show that to people, I think people start to see UX as something more than just design, which it often, in my experience, gets confused with very, very easily. Great, thank you. One last question. Obviously, if there's any more percolating and coming through, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. Uh, this question, reflective reasoning, reflective thinking and reflective practice. Is there a fundamental difference between the three? Just, uh, just repeat the three again, sorry. Reflective yep. reasoning, reflective practice and? Reflective thinking. Reflective thinking. Um, I would say that I'm not really sure if there's a difference between the reflective thinking is a part of, you know, reflective practice. Practice is the kind of getting yourself prepared and actually doing the reflective thinking. So reflective thinking is a, is a part of it. Um, and I think um, it, it really can, kind of forms the basis for everything that you do in reflective practice, because when you think um, and kind of reflect on yourself and the things that you're doing, um, that's the basis of becoming self-aware. Um, it's the basis of you being able to, you know, build up this habit in such a way that even when you're not taking that time out to reflect, you can find these little pockets of time, these moments where you can say, you know what, I've got enough time, I'm just going to quickly reflect on this. And it's, it will start to happen naturally. Um, I've seen it happening in, in other people that um, have tried this. I see it happening in myself where I can briefly kind of do it in between work and things and I can just pause and just kind of reflect on things. 
So to me, it all feels like it's one thing. Um, and I think they're all interconnected. I don't know if there's a distinguishing kind of difference between them. And I, I like the, the way that you phrase this as well and the emphasis on practice. Yes. That, that in and of itself, it's a thing to be learned and honed over time. Is, yeah. You know, by doing it frequently and little by little, mm. it does become that, that second second. Uh, and what's the phrase I'm trying to think of? That like well, second nature, isn't it? And I think connecting it back to that um, that learning model by Martin Broadwell, you know, the whole idea is even reflective practice starts. Well, you know, if you start building it up, one day your competency will grow to a degree where you just do it without thinking about it, and that that is possible for anybody. You know, it's not it's not something that you have to have a special skill with. Putting something like reflective practice into practice will start to make it second nature for you in, in the work that you're doing. And I've seen this in, in people that I've worked with and, and teams that I've led and mentored. You know, people have started to do this, you know, over a short, short period of time. All it takes is, is dedication, really. Yeah, absolutely. We've got a few more questions in the Q&A box. Yeah. And great. <laughs> Just thought I'd say. Thank you. And then I'm about to drop off now, but Imran, this has been a fantastic talk. Lots of love for you going on in the chat box. Everyone's um, Thank uh, you. singing your praises. And also check your Twitter when we've done as well. I will do. Thanks, Laura. Thanks for everything. Take care. No Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Yeah, so just like Laura says, a couple more questions came in while we were chatting there. So. Mm -hmm. um, a bit of a long one so let me just read through it as sometimes reflective practice can be quite personal and can expose individual feelings do you think do you feel reflective practice is best done alone or do you feel there is value in reflecting in one-on-ones or in small groups as a way to get support um i i would encourage you to start on your own to begin with that's the best way to start reflective practice um I think it allows you to come to terms with how you process your thoughts, allows you to come to terms with, um, you know, what you do with some of those thoughts and how you differentiate, you know, things that you think you can openly kind of go and affect and impact and other things that perhaps you can't. So I would definitely encourage you to start on your own. I think you can do reflective practice as a group. I know it's quite an important part of sprint and things like that. But in my experience, you, you kind of, for reflective practice to really work, it actually needs that personal feel to it it's like a deep dive into your inner most thoughts so i would definitely start on your own and build it out from then there might be opportunities um you know where you can do it in a team environment or as a group or even one-to-one -one with perhaps someone that you you know you report to um but i would start the process on your own and it might be for example you go to so you've got a one-to-one -one with your manager and you're thinking i want to really I want to really raise something, you know, that I've been thinking about. Well, you can reflect on it before and then go in prepared. And you can also have that time to really think about what things you want to say in what order and perhaps, um, you know, what you don't want to say. You want to kind of gauge what your manager says and things like that. So that, that I think, is where I would start on your own. Great answer. I think that also answers the, the last question that we had, which was around reflecting together with others. So hopefully Anna, that one answers, answers that question for you as well. Mm. Um, I think we're out of questions, unless there are any last minute ones. It's like Laura says, there's been a lot of love in the chat for you. <laughs> we can send you the transcript through for that. So you can- Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, I guess one final final question, I guess, if there's any assets or if additional learning or reading that you think people should kind of follow up on, on this. Um, um, that would be really good. Yeah, of course. What I've tried to do in my slide deck, uh, which I can happily make available and share, um, I've tried to include um, uh, anything that referenced any of the kind of learning models and research. And there's that particular paper by um, Harvard University from 2014 um, it's quite deep and dense, but if you're interested, I can't think of a better place to start um, on, um, you know, kind of uh, self-reflective practice and things like that. It, it goes into so much of the things that I've touched on, but um, it touches on so many other broader things that come into play. So I would, I would urge people to start with that paper. And then some of the other points that I've referenced, um, I would definitely look at the 
the piece around how the child's um, mind evolves is is really interesting. When I got interested in that, obviously being a father, but if you look into it, it kind of you know for UX practitioners, it's it's fascinating because if you're interested in psychology, it will lead you down this you know this path of really really interesting things that um, help you think about how your mind works versus a child's. No, that's great. So much, Imran. Thanks everybody for joining us. Um, we have got um, another NUX online event lined up for next month. So we'll be sharing the details in due course. So keep an eye out for that on Twitter. Um, yeah, and if there's any follow-up questions, I'm sure we can facilitate those via Twitter as well. Okay, cool. Um, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I appreciate all of the, um, the comments from everybody. Um, I appreciate obviously your help and Laura's as well for getting this whole this whole piece organized um and it it feels really good to have you know done this session and shared shared some thoughts from from my perspective so thank you everyone for coming along and um kind of asking questions as well <laughs>